Hey guys, Honda Japan made an announcement this week that from 2020, from the year 2020, they will change their corporate language for Honda Japan from Japanese to English. So what that means is that currently Honda Japan conducts all its meetings in Japan in Japanese and all its documentation and memos and everything else are all in Japanese. So it's their official corporate language in Japan is Japanese. So they're going to change all that to English. So their corporate meetings will be in English and all their documentation and so on will be English. The reason they're doing it is there are a lot of companies like Honda, of course, that have factories and offices and branches and franchises and, and all sorts of things all around the world. So Honda and Toyota and Toshiba and all the others. Uh, there's also the reverse too, which is sort of interesting. There, there are actually a lot of companies operating in Japan that are owned by foreign companies. So for example, McDonald's and, and companies like that that are owned by foreign companies. There's also a lot of companies in Japan that are owned by European companies. So their head offices are actually in Europe. And what happens, and we've actually done business with people here like this, what happens is the owner of the company or the owners of the company or the CEO of the company or the, the boss of the company will be a Swiss guy and he'll turn up in here and uh, uh, turn up here in Japan to check on how the Japan operation's going and nobody can speak English well enough to be able to communicate with him so they have to use translators. So, and that, that's sort of what the problem that Honda's got as well of course is that they have these big corporate meetings in Japan and decide all sorts of things and all the meetings are all conducted in Japanese which means if they do happen to have some of their their bosses from other parts of the world here at the meeting they have to have translators for them which of course slows down the whole process and if it's technical things and we've had this before too we've done business with people who've talked about this before as well if they have a technical thing for example engineering or something like that then often the translators don't understand enough about engineering to be able to to translate so you've got some engineers some Japanese engineers and some Swiss engineers sitting at a table trying to have a meeting uh, but they don't have a common language and the translators don't understand engineering well enough to be able to explain what the other person's saying so it's a big problem for big corporations like that so Honda's solution to that is to make make it uh, a policy and make the policy clear now that from 2020 all their management, middle management, junior management people will be expected to be able to conduct business in English. So it's a logical thing to do and it's sort of inevitable. It's sort of inevitable for these big multinational companies that they do have a language that they can all communicate in because I mean Honda wouldn't be doing it if, if it wasn't necessary of course and the reason that, you know they've obviously dragged their feet on it until now but they've decided that they have to do it. So they're biting the bullet and, and they're doing it as of 2020. So it's a good idea and it's, it seems inevitable that others will follow. There's already companies here that do this. Rakuten, Rakuten, you guys would know, we've talked about Rakuten before, they're an online online company, sort of like an eBay sort of, sort of thing, a little bit different, but sort of like eBay. And obviously they're global uh, and they have a rule there too that their staff have to speak English. There's a lot of smaller companies here. We know last company here that, that the new boss came in and said right everyone has to have a English proficiency score a TOEIC score of 750 or above uh, so slowly it is happening that companies of all sizes here who do business internationally we've got a big company here in, in Aichi called Lixel that make uh, toilets and porcelain and things and export around the world and they've brought in a policy too that they want their, their staff to speak English so there's a lot of companies here that are starting to do this small companies and bigger companies but it's a good idea and it's sort of inevitable they have to do it but the problem that we expect that they're going to have is that so let's we'll stick with Honda as the example is that they will have a lot of very important key people uh, in their Japan operation who don't speak English or whose English level is really really low and they have five years before the, the corporate language is going to change to English. Now, for a busy corporate person who's, who has a, you know, a busy corporate life and is very, very busy, it's very unlikely that anybody is going to go from, from beginner level to international business level English in five years as a, as a you know, 
considering they could probably only dedicate a couple of hours a week to it, it seems really unlikely that's going to happen. So that's going to be their first problem, is that they're going to get to 2020. And the reason that uh, a lot of these companies are picking 2020, we're hearing this a lot recently, is it's a psychological thing because of the Olympics. Obviously a company like Honda, you know, the Olympics are only going to be a really short time. A lot of people here are making a fuss about the Olympics, but the Olympics are going to be such a short period of time here. They're going to be, you know, they're only going to be going for a short period of time. There'll be a bit of preparation. There'll be a bit of flow on after it from, from tourism and so on. But realistically, in the big picture, it's only a, a, a small period of time for the Olympics. But sort of psychologically, because 2020 is a sort of a special date for Japan because the Olympics, it's sort of let's join the world, you know. There's a bit of this under, undercurrent at the moment. Let's, let's become more international. Let's join the world. Let's... Let's improve our English and, and get our English up to speed. Uh, so that's probably why they've picked that date. But it just seems really unlikely. Those of you who've, who, who've learned second languages, you know, you know, if you've only got a couple of hours a week, if you're a busy corporate person and you've only got a couple of hours a week, you know, to go from beginner to international business level English in five years is really unlikely. It's really unlikely. So that's going to be their first problem. They're going to get to 2020. And there's going to be a whole heap of their really key important people who just won't be up to speed. And they're just going to... So they'll have to either let those people go or they're going to have to fold and, and continue to use translators to sort that out. Uh, the other problem that they're going to have is, is new employees because there are companies here, you know, there's, there's others, you know, we mentioned Rakuten and some others, but there's also others like JAL and ANA and a few other companies like that here who have TOEIC. TOEIC's a test of international English communication. And there's, there's companies like a and and JAL and Rakuten and others here who have a, a minimum level that they expect from their, their new employees. So in other words, if you don't have a TOEIC score of 650 or better or 700 or better or 750 or better, you won't get a job with those companies. You won't get past the, uh, the original venting process, vetting process. They just won't even give you an interview because your, your English isn't good enough. And the problem with this is, is that Particularly with a company like Honda that wants the best, they want the best engineers and they want the best, you know, people obviously on their teams. But you know, five years from now, that means that the people who are high school students now or university students now are the people that Honda will be wanting to bring on board in five years' time. And the level here is just so poor. I mean, we did make a video about this previously when they, when independent companies have done studies on English levels, English proficiency levels for countries around the world, speaking English as a second language, you know, you've got all the European countries up the top, Sweden and, and all those countries uh, at the top of that list and then it comes down the list and then eventually it gets to China and South Korea and all these other countries and then below all them is Japan. It's something like 28th out of all the speaking English as a second language countries Japan's like number 28, it's really, really low. And when you live here, you soon see this, that the level here is really terrible. Because it's the focus in the schools and universities and things, they really just focus on memorizing stuff in books. You know, you read the question, you answer the question, you move on. And they, English is not really treated as a communication tool here. And most people have never practiced it as a communication tool, don't even think of it like that which means it's not uncommon here to meet 17, 18 year olds or university students here and say hello and they'll just look at you and go, oh, uh, uh, you know, some of them might say hello, uh, some of them might say hello, how are you, I'm fine, thank you, and you, because that's what it says in the textbook, uh, but the, there's, a, there's a lot of people here who just won't be able to respond, and if you actually ask them a question, there's a lot of them here that won't be able to respond, so it's a very small percentage of people here very, very small percentage of people here who speak English to a business level. Very, very few. It's really rare. I mean, we do business with lots of Japanese companies here, and yeah, there might have been one or two examples where we've come across people whose English was, was good enough to be able to do business in English, but it's really rare. It's really, really rare. So, because it hasn't been a focus of the education system, we talked about this on another video too, that, it, that if English for communication had been a focus of the Japanese education system, there'd be a lot of people here who could communicate in English, but it's never been the focus. It's never been the focus of the education system. So, 
there's very few people who can do it. The only ones that usually can are the ones that have gone above and beyond. They've, they've done extra study, so the school doesn't equip them, and university isn't good enough. Usually it's they've gone above and beyond. They've spent time in another country, or they've, they've done extra study, or they've done, gone to extra, extra classes or extra schools, or they've gone the extra distance and spent extra time studying. They're interested in it, and they've really tried hard, and they've got to a better level. The, main, the point of this is, is that what's going to happen is, is that, you know, after 2020, when Honda wants to get the best engineers in Japan, they're going to have to compromise, probably, because what's going to happen is they're going to look at a list of people and say, well, this guy's the best engineer, but his English level's really low. This guy's not such a good engineer, but his English level's good. Which one are they going to pick? And it's fairly likely they're going to pick the guy that's the better engineer, aren't they? So... It's a good idea, but initially this is going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for a lot of these big companies. They, they've already got problems at the moment that they can't communicate with the world. And, and what's happening is countries like, like China are just beating them. You know, we've mentioned this before. You can actually buy stuff online from China and have it, have it delivered to you here in Japan faster than, than if, if you're trying to do things in English. Now, we, we do this exercise sometimes for the English-friendly Japan directory that we, that, we, that we provide to you guys. So occasionally we'll do little experiments with things like this. We'll send emails to Japanese printing company, for example, trying to get some cards printed, and also send some, some emails to some Chinese companies trying to get some cards printed. And we'll send those emails in English, and the Chinese companies will get back to you within the same day with some reasonably good English in the email. Boom, straight away. And what do you need? And this is what we need. Okay, we can have them to you within three days. Okay. And three days later, you've already got the cards from the Chinese company and half the Japanese companies you won't have heard back from because no one in there can read your email. Uh, or after a few days, finally the person who, who understands a bit of English has worked out what your email says and finally answers you and it's too late. And, and on a big scale, this will be happening more and more where Japan just can't compete with a lot of these other companies, uh, other countries that that are just more on the ball. And there's this, there's another aspect to that too, is the cultural aspect. And we've talked about this a lot before as well, is that the cultural aspect is huge. You know, the way people do business in, in, in Japan and the way people do business in other countries is really different. And that cultural aspect is a huge hurdle too. And even when people here do speak English to a reasonably good level, nobody's taught them about the cultural differences, which are huge. I mean, we're always telling you guys about the way things are here in Japan and what we see here in Japan. But, and that's interesting to a lot of people who don't live in Japan. But to Japanese people, we've got the opposite going on. The things that we tell you about what it's like in Japan is normal for Japanese people, but it's all the stuff goes on outside Japan is baffling for a lot of Japanese people. And it's a huge barrier to communication quite often, even if people's English is okay. Usually they can't communicate in a way that is sort of clear enough for foreigners to understand. That happens a lot. You know, oh, I don't really know, I'm not really sure, all that sort of stuff that we get in Japanese and do it in English and it ends up being very confusing. So, the other aspect, and no doubt with a topic like this, what always comes up is people always jump at it and say, well, English, oh, and English-friendly videos often bring this on too. People go, oh, that, that means there might be a job opportunity for me. Uh, probably not. Probably not. The only, only way that this is going to produce any more jobs for foreigners is only going to be in situations where they would have hired, hired a foreigner anyway, except for the language barrier. So in other words, the policy at the moment of all these big companies and the Japanese government, in fact, as far as issuing visas, is that if a job can be done by a Japanese person, they prefer to hire a Japanese person. And again, this is the cultural thing as well, is that Japanese companies would much prefer to hire Japanese employees than they would to hire foreign employees. So, you know, for, in the case of an engineer, if you've got 20 people applying for a job as an engineer, you know, unless unless you happen to be the very best, if you're a German person or a or an American person or an English person, if you happen to be the best engineer by far, and if the the language of that company is now English, you might have a chance of getting that job. But you would need to be you'd need to be the best by far. If it was close, you know, if you were the best. There's a Japanese guy who was almost as good as you. There's a really good chance the Japanese guy would get it, because in most of these companies, 
foreigners don't have a really good reputation as far as the workforce and again it's a cultural difference thing it's a cultural difference is that a lot of the things that are respected in in, in the workplace in Western society are not respected in Japan and an example of that is the free thinking and doing it your own way and coming up with new ideas and criticizing you know criticizing the way things are done and all that sort of thing which in a lot of Western countries is considered to be a, a good employee someone who sees a problem and comes up with a solution and you know that sort of thing is seen in as a positive light in a lot of countries but often here it's not often you hear that's just an annoying employee if he, you know, they, they really want, the Japanese way of doing things is that the boss says what's to do and everybody bows and says, hey, and everybody does it. And I mean, there is some innovative companies like Toyota and other companies like that now who, who want suggestions from staff and take suggestions from staff and new ideas from staff and that sort of thing. And there is that, there is that element of business in Japan. However, it really often is only skin deep. And the reality is the bosses, most of the bosses at all levels, just want the staff to do what they're told. And to be efficient and on time and not late and all these other things. And unfortunately foreigners in most companies and in most situations, foreigners generally have a bad reputation for not being able to conform with the Japanese way of doing business here. So as far as that question of does you know, a company like Honda changing their language to English give foreigners a better chance of getting a job here, well, not really, not unless you're the best person for the job already. If they need a, a, an IT engineer and you're the best in the world, then, or if you're better than the other people applying, you know, if there's 20 people applying and you're the best one, as far as your skills and qualifications and everything, then maybe you've got a chance. But you'd have to be better by far, you really would, or if you're a mechanical engineer or, or whatever, you'd really have to be the best candidate by far for them to even consider you. And it's a bit of a generalization, it's not always the case, but 99% of, of the time it is. And people who've applied for jobs in Japan would know this, you know. And, and again, it's the, the policy of the companies, and sometimes officially the policy of the companies, sometimes unofficially, you know, they just have that attitude that they prefer to employ Japanese people. And the same Japanese government has the same policy as far as visas are concerned. You know, that's why you can't get a job here working in McDonald's, you know, usually as a foreigner because you're not going to get a visa to do that. They, they want, they only want to give visas to people who can do a job in Japan that a Japanese person can't do, which is fair enough. I mean, most of the other developed countries around the world have similar policies, but they're not going to let people come and work in the country unless they're going to bring some skills that don't already exist in the, in the country. So. So as far as that's concerned, this probably isn't going to ch change a lot. It, it might make it easier to deal with these companies and communicate with them, because at the moment, most of them, even the big ones, even the foreign-owned ones, are difficult to deal with in in, in Japan at the moment. You know, that the, they just don't have that connection with the world. A lot of them, you know, the Japanese, the, the Japanese National Tourist Association, uh, no, Japanese National Tourist Organization, uh, don't have any way of people communicating with them in email. So that's the, the <laughs> they're talking about all the time here about bringing in more tourists. They want more tourist dollars, you know, they want to bring in more tourists. You can't communicate with the Japanese National Tourist Organization by email. And you can try, if you can track down an email address for them, which isn't easy, if you do try and communicate with them, we've tried a few times about different things, no answer. Just no answer. So, you know, this is, and that's really common with, with lots of big companies in Japan. So, so yeah, the steps that Honda's taking are definitely a good idea, but just making something a policy, you know, the Prime Minister said recently, the Japanese Prime Minister said recently that, that, that they've got to make it a policy that, that people have to pass an English proficiency test to get into university, which is a, is a great idea, but <laughs> unless they make it a really easy test, most people are going to flunk it. So just setting, it's a very Japanese style of doing things, is set, make a rule, make a policy, as if that's going to sort of magically make, solve the problem, the English, the lack of English skills problem, and of course it won't, will it? That's a separate issue, so. Anyway, there it was. All interesting, isn't it, to some people? The two of you that are still watching this video, <laughs> the other people who are watching the video considered it wasn't interesting. More videos coming soon. <laughs>